Good morning and welcome to the latest in IMAP's uh, webinar series, uh, part of this virtual world that we all live in. Um, it's a pleasure for me today to um, be able to bring um, uh, Michael Karagiannis uh, from Jana Consultants and um, Rebecca Jakes from Mercers um, to a webinar today to talk about um, bringing institutional expertise to advice practices. Today's session will be uh, chaired and moderated by Paul Saliba from Evolutionary Portfolio Services. Um, so we've got a really interesting group today of, of two of uh, Australia's largest and leading um, institutional asset consultants who've both chosen um, to be represented and active um, in retail advice um, world. Um, with a particular focus on managed accounts. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, let me just uh, share with you um, a couple of things which we're doing um, over the next um, few months as we uh, manage our lives um, in this virtual way. So um, over, the next, uh, over the next few months, um, uh, an exciting time for us. Uh, the awards which um, our awards uh, judging panel has been, uh, uh, believe me, um, actively involved um, in assessing, um, comes to uh, um, fulfilment on the 27th of August, um, when we'll be running a streamed um, awards ceremony uh, at five o'clock on the 27th. So five asset classes, Australian equities, um, small caps, fixed interest, multi-asset class, um, uh, and yeah, um, uh, plus a licensee category, plus a, uh, an innovation awards category. So I'm really looking forward to, to that. Um, and only sorry that we can't celebrate with a, a real live glass of champagne with the, with the winners. Um, uh, Investec is, our, is one of our uh, cornerstone events each year. Um, and this year we'll be holding that virtually and our I'll be saying a little more about that in, in just, a, just a moment. Um, and then the portfolio management conferences. This year um, to be held in November, um, and our plan was originally Sydney, uh, uh, Sydney on the 10th of uh, November, uh, Melbourne on the 18th of November, and, and uh, a pretty likely um, event in Perth on the 16th of November. I think it's almost certain that the Melbourne event won't be in a position to proceed. Um, and so we're making contingency plans for that. We hope to be able to hold um, the portfolio management conferences live, um, but uh, these are troubled times. Um, so let me talk very briefly about Investec. So um, in the week of the 7th of September, we'll be running five sessions from Monday to Friday, talking to the issues of technology as it applies in advice practices um, and, with, um, and with a managed account focus. I've listed a few of the topics on the screen. And believe me, as we now work through those sessions, where there really are um, interesting sessions focused on the use of technology to better develop advice practices. Technology is what's really driving um, the the creation of advice and its technology that's really transforming um, advice from being very product led to being genuinely advice led. Um, I'm really excited by Investec. Uh, the title is um, Spoiled for Choice Beset by Risk. And you'll see in every session that we touch on that theme of so much choice for advisors and licensees, but so difficult to put together a technology stack which actually embeds the business model that I want for my business. Um, of spoiled for choice in managed accounts, obviously central to, to IMAP. Um, but interesting topics like what the robos know you don't. How, how does a completely hands-off business on board deliver genuine compliant advice, manage an ongoing relationship? Um, Nucleus and uh, um, and, a couple, and a number of other presenters will talk to us uh, about that. Um, digital portfolio management. 
um, you'll be surprised at the tools that are coming from some of the platforms now to facilitate the creation of compliant advice um, to facilitate um, advice businesses. Now, in today's session, um, if you want to ask a question, um, down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a black, uh, you'll see a Q&A button. Click on that, type in your question, the panelists will see it um, and will deal with it as they go at the time or, or, or return to the question later on. So thanks very much. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Paul Saliba to introduce Rebecca Jakes and Michael Karagiannis. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you, Toby, and good afternoon to you all. Uh, today, we're here to discuss um, institutional consultants and perhaps consulting more broadly and how perhaps uh, they can assist with businesses uh, looking to improve their investment um, solution in aggregate. Um, today, we have Rebecca Jakes, as uh, Toby said. She's a principal in Mercer's institutional wealth management business. And as a senior investment consultant, Rebecca is involved in preparing strategic investment advice to institutional and wealth management clients, as well as supporting the focus on delivering retirement income solutions. Uh, Rebecca's based in Sydney. I noticed that she went to uh, Monash University, which I did also. So we both come from a good pedigree. Um, she is, was also chief operating officer of a boutique hedge fund um, established by the chairman of the AIMA Australia. Uh, she's had her own consultancy business in the past and she's been with Mercer for some time now. So we welcome uh, Rebecca. We also welcome Michael Karagiannis from Jana Investment Advisors. Uh, Michael heads up Jana's retail consultancy business and focuses on providing advised and implemented solutions to financial advisors and practices. Um, and he's had prior roles as head of private investment consulting at NAB Asset Management uh, and other roles previously. He has a degree from, uh, in economics from Adelaide University. I won't hold that against him, but um, so there's two of us from Monash and, and one of us from uh, uh, across in South Australia. Um, I suppose Rebecca and I are fortunate in that we are not in Melbourne at the moment and suffering the lockdown issues that uh, you all uh, are facing for those of you who are in Melbourne. Our sympathies uh, are certainly with you. Um, today is about investment consulting. And I think it's interesting that uh, the world is moving to more and more engagement of consultants, be they um, institutional, your more retail focus or your smaller groups such as the business that I have. Um, advisors have been managing investment portfolios for clients since the very start of financial planning. And um, it is a new phenomenon to move to this consulting arrangement. So I might ask Rebecca, how do you see uh, the institutional consultant adding value to a financial planning business? Yeah, thanks, Paul. I'm glad to know that you also went to university at Monash as well. <laughs> um, look, I mean, from our perspective, you know, the advisors have always been, you know, delivering solutions to clients and we're not, um, we don't take that away from them. But what we do recognise is that the world of advice now is extremely, probably more so than ever under pressure to deliver, you know, enhanced investment outcomes They've also got to give greater control, greater transparency to their clients. And they've also got to achieve cost efficiencies, both for their clients and, and for their businesses. So uh, what Mercer does essentially is we bring uh, 45 plus years of experience to the table in investment consulting um, to work with advice practices to essentially tailor a solution um, that fits the needs of their, their client base. Um, now, I mean, there's a whole gamut of things that we believe we, we deliver in terms of value add. I mean, obviously things like, um, you know, we're a global research house, you know, we've been delivering capital markets assumptions for, for many years, you know, the modelling capabilities and essentially, um, and I think one of the areas that also goes a little bit underrated is, is the, the, what we classify as an investment governments and compliance framework. So essentially the checks and balances on us 
and our models and the implementation of that, um, which I think is increasingly critical, um, particularly in that advice landscape as well. You're on mute, Paul. Yes, I'm on mute. Sorry, everybody. Uh, I've done this before. Uh, Michael, is there anything that you see differently or from Jana's perspective, uh, you, you would like to add to those comments from Rebecca? Yeah, look, um, you know, I think, uh, I mean, Jana similarly is a, a, a long established institutional investment consultant uh, over 30 years of operating within the, uh, the Australian institutional market, uh, providing consulting services. Uh, we, we have about 65 clients, um, many of them industry funds, family offices, uh, insurance companies. Uh, the decision that we made to move into the retail space is, is almost two years ago now. Uh, we view it as a market that uh, has you know, very similar requirements uh, in terms of expertise that uh, can be delivered uh, quite well by a, an institutional consultant as well as perhaps uh, boutiques and individuals. Um, you know, I think the, the, there, are, there are a lot of similarities in terms of the essence of what is required from a consultant, be they a boutique or an individual or an institutional client, uh, a consultant. I think uh, a robust investment process, um, and I think, uh, you know, Rebecca made the point that uh, I think that, uh, you know, it is becoming much more uh, uh, in demand to have that rigour around the investment process. I think platforms are demanding it. Um, REs are requiring it, so uh, the consultant can certainly bring that uh, additional uh, governance uh, and, and process and, and philosophy to an investment uh, uh, a requirement that a, an advice business has. Um, support with the administration of portfolios and the ongoing management of them. I think many advisors underestimate just how uh, much time ultimately can be chewed up in this area. Um, and uh, while there's always great intent to try and insource that and perhaps, uh, you, know, um, that, you know, really provide that from a, a, pr a practice perspective, I think that uh, what we're seeing now is increasingly practices understanding that their major value add is really in terms of strategic advice, and it's good to bring in the professionals that can help with the investment side, as well as help with the administration of the investment side and, and really take a lot of that burden off. I think the institutional consultants have certain advantages and you know, I think it's horses for courses, um, but the institutional consultants clearly have uh, a lot of resourcing that they can draw on. So it's not just those who are actually engaged with the, um, uh, the advisors, but the whole research team that sits behind them. So you're not just dealing with an individual who are effectively engaged with a whole uh, business that has people focusing on manager research, capital markets research, the, the amount of um, um, resourcing that's put into systems that can be drawn into this space as well. And of course, you can't rule out the, the balance sheet issue. I think that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think the last time I looked, there was something like 30 odd investment consultants operating, ranging from institutional boutique through to individuals in the marketplace. You know, frankly, I don't think all of them are going to be around in, in, in five years' time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's not saying that, you know, you should only deal with institutional, but you need to be cognizant of the longevity or the potential longevity of the consultant that you're engaged with. You want them to be around over the longer term. And I think certainly institutional consultants can tick that box. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, there are uh, a lot of advantages that come with being engaged with a consultant irrespective of the nature of the consultant, there are certain things that an institutional consultant can bring to the table as well. Very good. Uh, I suppose you started to touch on it. Um, so why should practices look to engage in a consultant? You talked about things like philosophy, um, the research backing uh, mm -hmm. and the resourcing. Um, you know, often practices in my experience have, you know, their own philosophy, they have some of their own beliefs. Um, and my experience is, is that, you know, it, they don't really want to shift too significantly away from perhaps an existing set of beliefs and, and, and philosophy. Um, yeah. So, you know, why should they look to engage a consultant? Yeah, look, and I, I think that that's, that's a fair point. And I think that, um, you know, it, it shouldn't be the case that a client or an advisor has to give up on those beliefs they, you know, the advisor should really look to engage a consultant that's going to work with them 
to help them pursue those beliefs and that philosophy more fully. And that, I think, does throw a lot of focus on picking the right consultant to work with. And it's not saying there's bad consultants or good consultants. It's just picking the right consultant through that selection process so that you get what you want out of that process and you're not having to conform to a set of beliefs and philosophies that you really don't share or, or uh, feel that fit with you. Um, I think also from a practical point of view, engaging a consultant is increasingly becoming the ticket to the game. So going back a few years ago, uh, an advice business could set up their own managed account program. The governance hurdles were probably not as great. Um, you know, you could realistically insource it. All that has changed. I mean, governance is becoming a much tougher process to go through. The hurdles are becoming much higher. Engaging a consultant as part of that process is almost becoming de rigor now. Um, and I think that that is only going to continue down this path. So you can say that's maybe an unfortunate development or a fortunate development, depending on your perspective. But I think that is the reality of it. Um, and certainly, I think that um, you know, increasingly, we are seeing advice businesses that uh, have already established managed account programs uh, where they haven't got a consultant now looking to bring a consultant into that picture to you know, just really you know, raise the bar, if you like, in terms of the overall process. Sure. Uh, Rebecca, I'm gonna, there's a question that I've, has come through and I'll ask that question and then perhaps you can answer that question and then if you've got anything to add to what Michael's just said, feel free to. So the question is, how granular uh, do you get when helping an advisor with a retail client? So perhaps um, start with that question and then touch on what Michael said, if you've got anything to add there. Um, so, I mean, essentially what happens with Mercer is, um, you know, you, we, we work with you to actually tailor the solution for, the, for your actual practice. So um, the granularity is, I mean, the one thing, the, the only caveat that we ever put over it is ultimately the know your client rule sits with the advisor. Right, so we we cannot um, supersede that in any way. But in terms of, do we assist in in looking at the appropriateness of investments based on, you, you know, their, their sort of risk profile or income requirements? Um, absolutely. Um, do do we look at overall investment objectives? Um, do they work for what the client's seeking to achieve in the advice practice? So, I mean, our operating model basically caters for input um, from the practice into the design and the specific solution um, that we, we look to, to sort of create with you or bring on board. So, I mean, without going through every sort of minutia point that we will look at, I mean, you know, we work very closely with the advisors and the practices to, to tr either transition them in, into a managed account solution or to onboard their existing managed account solution into that sort of investment and government framework that Mercer's built. Okay, so Michael, that answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. I think it says you do it at a certain level that really then relies on the advisors, know your client, as well as know your product and the matching of those two things to come together. So you provide a, a solution that's generally suitable for the business that specifically may need some alteration or in some instances may not suit a, a particular individual, but uh, the advisors have to work through that component. Is that fair to say? Well, no, I mean, in the sense that see, basically we build whatever solution is required by the business. So um, every solution that we build is tailor made um, to fit the requirements of the advice business. So. If the advice business, you know, only has one type of client, which is highly unlikely, but, yes. you know, um, then we build to, to that one type of client solution that they need. If they happen to have three different types of sort of broad segment client base, um, then we'll build the managed account solution across that. I mean, um, but essentially our, our commitment to working with advice practices is based on their commitment to working in the managed account solution. It, so, you know, the more committed they are to their client base going into a managed account solution, um, I guess the, the more granular we get, um, because obviously we have greater insight into the type of client base that's in there, the type of needs that need to be met. 
Um, and I'd argue that is exactly the same in wholesale consulting land. You know, um, the, the more you want to work with us and the more information you give us, the more we can build a bespoke solution for you. You know, and, and essentially Mercer doesn't, doesn't really offer managed accounts off the shelf, right? You can't go and find, a, a, um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, certain practices we work with at the moment want us to build some generic type models, which we are doing. But there is no, like, here is the Mercer managed account, please use this, basically. And Michael, from your perspective, how granular do you get when, you know, working with an advisor and, and, and a retail client? It's... Yeah, so uh, I think the important distinction is that no consultant is most likely licensed to provide advice to retail clients directly. Um, and generally should not be providing advice to the retail client. That is the business and preserve of the advisor. That's what the retail client appoints the advisor for. Our client um, is the consultant and we bill specification portfolios to their requirements. So uh, as, as Rebecca was saying, we don't have off the shelf portfolios. We build them bespoke for every advice practice. Um, the nature of managed accounts is really advisors looking to try and, I guess, get efficiencies from aggregating client solutions rather than having, you know, literally hundreds of individual advice solutions going out to the clients, trying to standardise it as much as possible to get maximum efficiency and, and I guess, maximum similarity in terms of outcomes for their clients. So that's a very important consideration. And our role really is to engage with the advisor to deliver what they want. Um, so spending a lot of time with the advisor, consulting with them, understanding what they what the solution is that they're trying to deliver to their clients, um, you know what the price point is that they're trying to deliver it at, what constraints they're operating with, uh, whether their clients are in pension phase largely or in accumulation phase or something in between, building the portfolios accordingly. But it's not the delivery of advice to the underlying individual retail client. That is the ultimate responsibility of the advisor through their SOA. Yeah. Um, what level of internal resourcing do you like to see or expect to see in an advice practice before you're willing to take them on as a client? Who, who would you like to answer that one? Uh, well, let's start with you because you're not on mute and then we'll go to Rebecca once you're done. Okay. Um, so it's not so much the resourcing. I mean, we, we're working with uh, practices that um, you know, basically have no internal uh, resourcing in terms of uh, uh, researchers, for example, and that's what they're looking for a consultant to basically provide. Their, their expertise is purely in terms of engaging with their clients um, and they need to partner with someone that is able to uh, provide all of that infrastructure around them. And that, that for example, could be a fully outsourced uh, implemented model where we basically take over the responsibility as model manager um, and do all the administration, all the ongoing management of the portfolios, uh, all the instructions associated with the portfolios, all the reporting of the portfolios. It's fully outsourced by the advisor. It's maximum efficiency from, uh, from their perspective. However, there are other advice groups and, and indeed licensees that have an internal research capability where they actually want to retain some part of that. They want their own investment committee. They want to retain discretionary decision making. They want to actually implement the portfolios. So they want to have more ownership. And that's more of a sub-advisory type of relationship that we would have with them where we're simply a voice or a, an input into the investment process. Uh, and we're equally happy to work on either basis uh, in that regard. It just depends on the, the requirement of the client base. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really trying to be as flexible as possible to work with the advisor to give them what they need and want out of the process rather than being prescriptive, saying this is the way we do it and that's the only way we're prepared to do it moving forward. Yeah, I suppose, um, Rebecca, is, you know, certainly when I was at IWF and uh, elsewhere, um, you go to different practices and they all have their own slight different uh, thoughts around different aspects to investing, be it passive and active, be it value and growth, uh, emerging markets, no emerging markets, fixed interest, duration, all sorts of things practices come up with 
different um, ideas and have different thoughts. What sort of um, expectations, or if any, do you have around the the resourcing internal to a practice before you're willing to uh, work with them? Yeah, I, I, look, my answer would be almost identical to Michael's. Okay. You know, essentially, we work the whole gamut of the spectrum from where there are no resources at all, um, you know, right through to where there is an investment committee that is directly involved in every single decision that, that we're all, like it's a joint decision making process throughout the, the, the side of it. So um, it's, it's not so much the resourcing, it, it, as I come back to, it's more always, um, you know, it's their commitment to, to putting, you know, to utilising the managed account service, you know, and you basically what we say is essentially supercharging your investments, right? Because you can use the powerhouse that sits underneath Mercer, um, you know, to gain cost efficiencies, uh, greater transparency, you know, fee reductions, all sorts of stuff that come to the table. Um, you know, the level of resources that you have, uh, it, it's entirely dependent on, you know, the degree to which you wish to, you know, engage with us in terms of portfolio design and operation. Yeah. Um, I suppose this is kind of like a, a, an addendum to that question, is if a practice has certain solutions, a product that they, uh, that they might like, um, that may not align with your own internal research rating. What happens with in that scenario? Yeah, yeah that, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I think different consultants would answer that differently. So we are aware of consultants that you know basically would say, look, we, we can't engage, we're not prepared to take that on. Uh, interestingly, I mean, we come across this all the time in the institutional space, um, where institutional clients have uh, internal research teams that have their own particular view or they uh, you know just have a grandfathered relationship and we we've made a conscious decision to emulate that model into the uh, retail space as well so there may be very good reasons why even you know though a product or a strategy within a uh, model portfolio or managed accounts is not part of our what we call our active list that we have great uh, confidence and uh, uh, have have done a lot of research on and we've reached a level of uh, quite uh, high comfort to recommend the advisor wants to retain it um, and it might be because they have a relationship or they've undertaken due diligence themselves over a period of time it might be because there are grandfather issues there might be capital gains tax issues we're comfortable to work with that um, as long as they realize that you know, it's not our recommendation it's their own recommendation I guess that much maligned term you know captain's pick and we have clients that, uh, where there are clearly uh, you know, strategies in there that we would not have recommended, but they coexist with strategies that we do. Um, and uh, you know, we're very comfortable to, uh, to manage the portfolios uh, nonetheless. I think the, uh, you know, the, the, the question I would pose is that you know, if an advisor is not receptive to a consultant bringing in manager ideas to some extent, then you've sort of got to think, well, you know, what are they trying to get out of that manager, or that advisor consultant relationship? So, you know, we would hope that when we engage with an advisor, that there are some ideas that we can bring to the table that will influence the portfolios. But we fully understand that that is not always going to be the case. And we're happy to work with that. And Rebecca, how do you kind of see that or approach things where a practice may like a particular strategy, but it's not in your research Teams, uh, yep. you know, approved rating, or it's not on their agenda at the time, at the moment, or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I'll, I mean, let me. I mean, in the very first instance, the whole entire managed account service that actually facilitates and allows the retention, right, of existing, existing asset allocation as well as existing manager lineups, right. Um, then overlay it with, you know, well, what what's Mercer's view or, or concept around it. Um, consultancy is all about uh, solving for the direct needs of the client, which research is, is not about, okay? Research is about identifying um, very strong investment capability, but not necessarily making the judgment call of whether that's applicable or appropriate for the individual client. Um, and that's always how um, 
nurses consultancy business has worked, which is where managed accounts sit. So we refer to it as like the empowered consultancy model, which is essentially our role is to ensure that our clients have the right solutions that work for them. Now, overlay over that the fact that we would, you know, globally, we research over 7,000 managers. There's something like 35,000 strategies that we cover. Um, you know, and of those sort of 35,000 investment strategies, you know, close to 60% of them are investment grade. So there's not an awful lot of sort of, you know, sort of areas that we don't cover and don't have an opinion on. And, you know, whilst, we're, whilst our whole process is about facilitating retention of existing investment relationships as well, um, it, it is to Michael's point that, you know, the advice landscape and the investment landscape is constantly shifting, right? So, you know, you might have had a very long standing relationship and there may be capital gains or embedded taxes in, in strategies that you do not wish to crystallise. And, and we totally agree with that for the client solution, right? But over time, the aim is that, that you would wish to be still giving your clients the best investment solutions that you can. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so we do seek that there is some sort of degree of partnership that they want to work with us, you know, and, and we, I mean, when you cover what we cover globally, you know, we've got, you know, 1300, you know, investment, dedicated investment people globally. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of things we cover, you know, I'd be hard pressed to find that there'd be many investment strategies that we don't have a, a genuine deep insight into or manager to probably work very closely with the client. Sure, okay. Um, so I suppose the question then is how does uh, a practice or a, a financial planner, how are they serviced? Do they build, how will you build up the relationship? Will it be sort of um, what you might get from an individual? Uh, I suppose, let's start with Rebecca. How do you kind of, how is the service provided and what's the kind of relationship that's built along the journey? Yeah, yeah. so essentially, um, you know, with an advice practice or, or a licensee or, you know, whatever, they, their service model is exactly the same as what we do in consultancy, which is you receive your own dedicated investment consultant who is supported by at least two to three either senior consultants, senior analysts that work directly on your account. Um, so they get to know you very well. Um, they should know, you know, and have a very deep understanding of your investment proposition and how you want it reflected in your client portfolios. And then essentially that team is constantly leveraging, you know, the 150 resources we have here domestically, the 1300 globally, to ensure that what you're getting suits your needs and your practice. Um, so it is a very personalised relationship. And we also overlay, to, to be honest, we overlay over the top of it what we call a relationship model, whereby you get a dedicated um, six monthly check-in by essentially like my boss, basically, for want of a better word. Um, you know, and if you don't like me, um, you can say, I don't like, you know, love the service, but I really just don't like Rebecca. You know, who else have you got out there that I could talk to? Um, so it is very bespoke and we treat it as a, as a partnership. It's, it's, you know, it's a relationship that we believe is there, you know, for the medium to long term. Um, you know, many of our clients, we service, you know, five, 10 plus years. So, you know, that's the sort of relationship we want and we want that open dialogue and to know your practice very well. Yeah, and certainly um, that doesn't seem too different to my world, except for if you don't like me, I'm the only person, so you have to actually go to <laughs> someone else. But, yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> Michael, uh, from your perspective and Jana's perspective, is there anything different in relation to how you build the relationship and how you manage that and how, how that works? Uh, no, I, I mean, inherently it's, it's probably the same and it's been built up uh, as I'm sure Moose's would, would attest to, uh, you know, lengthy involvement with institutional clients, you know, longevity of relationships there. No client, whether they're institution or an advice practice, wants to deal with an organisation. They want to deal with individuals. And so basically we, we set ourselves up effectively as uh, as a partnership model, if you like, where, you know, I, I head up the, the retail practice and if we have a client in this space it'll be myself uh, the 
it's probably lead consultant. Um, there'll be a, an associate um, that is very much involved that the client gets to know, and we're sort of the point people that really the client will have uh, you know sort of day to day interactions with. And there'll be a, a client liaison uh, person that really uh, is there to uh, you know assist in more uh, you know, administrative associate. Uh, uh, commercial type aspects, but it's a very small team that the client gets to know and is familiar with. And we really maintain those relationships over a long period of time. And, and as Rebecca points out, you know, there's the ability to uh, you know, bring someone else in if the client has a, a real problem, but really, you know, it, it's a very personalized service. But the important distinction, I guess, is that uh, when, when I'm consulting to a client, um, you're not getting my views, you're getting the wealth of knowledge that sits within the business. Um, so there's only so much coverage I can have of uh, manager research and capital markets research and the client's requirements. So basically what we, we basically are doing is funneling an enormous amount of research and wealth through us as the portal to the client and trying to meet the client's requirements based on the wealth of that knowledge. And I think that that's where you know, having that, that enormous research base uh, can be an advantage because of the depth of research that it does give you. It is a double-edged sword, potentially, because I suppose if a, a, a business is relying on the individual's views, if they don't coincide with the house view, um, and indeed may contradict the house view, and they're just pushing the house view because that is the house view, that can be an awkward scenario, right? Whereas that won't happen with an individual consultant. No, by definition, it wouldn't happen with an individual consultant. But I would argue, can an individual consultant be expert at everything? Um, I mean, you know, I've, I've been in financial markets a long time. I've got certain areas of expertise. But frankly, I don't have the ability to research all the available asset managers to the required depth of research and capital market research and provide a consulting solution to the client and, and have a very good detailed understanding of them. So. You know, if I was to say, well, look, okay, we've got a, a fixed income research team or Australian equity research team that is comprised of people that are spending the majority of their time researching the best managers in that space, you know, what does my personal opinion really count for in that space? I mean, if, if I think I know better than them, then I think I'm probably kidding myself. And so, you know, in a sense, I'm, I'm not sure that it's a conflict as such. It's just a different model where we have expertise that resides in different parts of the business that we can tap into. And by virtue of having that greater resource base, we can actually drill down and get much more granular with the level of research that we're doing. Um, so for example, we did a, uh, our ESG team did a, a research paper recently on um, climate change and the investment implications of that for institutional and it's just got as much implication for uh, um, uh, retail clients. Now, you know, I can, I can put forward some views and so on, but they've gone into great detail to research it and they spend most of their time focused on it. And, and for me to gainsay them and say, well, look, I disagree with you and I'm not going to tell that to my client, I think is, um, you know, would be the height of arrogance, frankly. Sure. Uh, I, I, I rely on them as, as the expert subject matter. Sure. And, and I suppose in investment consultants that are individual probably rely on third party uh, solutions or third party providers of that sort of supporting uh, detail and and they convey having looked at perhaps different providers what they think might be the most useful so there is different ways of approaching that there's yeah. a question yeah. here around uh, having more than one asset consultant or more than one uh, external consultant on an investment committee and an advisory group um, is that a good or bad scenario is if, the, if you've already got an established investment committee and the advisory group has more than one external consultant, is that good or bad? Rebecca, what are your thoughts around that? Um, yeah, I think it depends. Um, it depends on, on, I guess, the role of the consultants and the, you know, on that, that, that sort of panel or, or committee. Um, I always, I probably would always err on the side of, you know, that sort of, if, if, you know, if I've got three research houses that approve it, then I'll put it on, my, you know, like my approved product list. I mean, I think you end up in trouble with those sorts of, there's too many like cooks basically in the kitchen, you know, um, and, and it, what happens when they are polar opposites apart, right? So what, what, 
what does the investment committee then choose? Um, but I don't think that there's anything wrong whatsoever in saying, you know, I'm using this consultant because I believe, you know, they bring X to the table and I would like this consultant to work with me much more closely on, on sort of Y. Um, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, we work like that with Fortnum, um, you know, um, because they still utilise, obviously, ANOVA in, in their investment committee. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, we respect ANOVA's opinion, they expect, respect our opinion, but, but we each have our sort of, I guess, places within that investment committee and what we do and the areas that we look after. So it's probably not the easiest answer, but I tend to find that, you know, you're, you're better off working at least either with one core um, investment consultant and then potentially you might use others to, you know, supplement or support in certain areas. Okay. And Michael, in terms of your perspective, do you see an issue or a challenge or positivity or negativity around having perhaps two consultants on one investment committee? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, in fact, it's, it's, it's increasingly common in the institutional space. Um, what, what I echoing probably what Rebecca mentioned, I think it's, it's, it's important to be very clear about what you want out of your investment consultants, what role they are fulfilling. And it may be if you choose to take on two investment consultants, they have different areas of expertise. Um, and so that's about understanding what the, the, the capabilities of each consultant is. I think any consultant that says they're fantastic in everything um, and can, can do everything and don't need, uh, you know, the, the, there's no role for anyone else in that process, I think is, you know, I think that's a, a pretty arrogant position. So we, we see it in the institutional space. Um, in terms of investment committees we're working with at the present time in the retail space, it's not unusual to have an independent. Um, now, they may or may not be a consultant as such, but they may certainly have a, a say a governance role to play, um, which uh, can be supplementary to the portfolios or to the management of the portfolios. Um, there may be a, a role for someone uh, on an investment committee that uh, you know, has a particular area of accent. Uh, for example, if a, a portfolio has a, a direct equity perspective to it, uh, they might have more of a, a direct equity capability, for example. So I think, uh, we intrinsically we're not opposed to it at all. Uh, it's just a question, I think, uh, for the the uh, the advice business to be very clear about what the role is of the consultants, what they expect out of them. Um, you don't want to be in a situation you you you're getting everyone to line up and agree. Neither do you necessarily want an adversarial situation all the time where everyone has a different view and it's very hard to come to decisions. So I think that clarity on how the the investment committee operates and, and uh, you know, who's got a voice in what regard is, is very important. Um, could the panelists comment on who active practices are in decision making at the moment, i.e. has COVID and other regulatory distractions slowed down business growth? So is there and obviously probably not to name names, but um, certainly are you seeing that um, the issues of the day that are now compounded, I would suppose, by COVID, uh, are they impacting inquiries and people signing up to services and that sort of thing? Um, Paul, I'm happy to answer it in, in, from Mercer's perspective. The, the short answer is no, it hasn't impacted it. It's actually, to a certain extent, um, made it more come forward a lot quicker. Um, so a lot of practices have, um, that we've been working with over a period of time, um, you know, have, I guess, fast tracked the decision to, to implement either managed account solutions or, or you know, appoint consultants. Um, yep. I think largely because of just, you know, the uncertainty. Um, and I think just the ever increasing pressure on advisors to keep delivering enhanced investment outcomes, let alone reporting requirements that fall into it, um, the usual monitoring administration and all the rest of it that goes along with it. So, so you know, the only impact I'd say is that we're doing it all virtually. Um, but, you know, has it stopped decision making? No, um, not in any way, shape or form. Anything different from you, Michael, in that respect? Seeing more no. inquiry, less inquiry? Uh, no, I think there's a, a pretty reasonable uh, level of inquiry. Um, I think there was certainly a hiatus going back, um, you know, sort of nine to 12 months ago, 
uh, that probably had a lot to do with the, the Royal Commission. Um, and I think that uh, that slowed down people's processes, but we're certainly seeing a, a movement towards self-licensing, uh, which is uh, really not abating. If anything, it's, I think, accelerating at this point in time. I will say that that's often the, the, the precursor to going down the managed account path. So I think that, you, you know, businesses want to get that out of the way uh, and then move into their investment solution and try and formalise that rather than the other way around. Um, but we're seeing certainly a, a fair bit of inquiry in the managed account space. I would also say that there is a bit of inquiry uh, going on in terms of established managed account um, programs where the advice practice has been running with a, an SMA or an MDA program for a couple of years or more. Um, they've got an established consulting relationship or they may not have an existing consulting relationship and they're looking to disturb that relationship or go back and re-tender for services. Now maybe it's because they uh, there's something missing in that relationship at this point in time that they want to get a better outcome um, or maybe it's just a governance process that they believe it should be done on a periodic basis. I think that's a very healthy development and certainly something we see in the institutional space. It's all part of that increasing focus on good governance uh, to make sure that uh, you know you're not simply in relationships in this space uh, for a long period of time without really reviewing what is best practice and, and what is available out there so uh, no it's a very healthy uh, level of uh, activity at this point in time and uh, you know long may it continue <laughs> terrific um obviously there's you know pretty uncertain times we've been through a period of pretty significant volatility uh, obviously, it's come off somewhat, but it's still fairly significant. Uh, at the moment, do either of you have very strong views around varying from your neutral asset allocation? Uh, Rebecca, if we can start with you, perhaps. Um, so, we, uh, Paul, we do what's referred to as dynamic asset allocation, which is not tactical, okay? So, um, we, we don't believe in the game of trying to you know, time markets weekly or monthly. Um, and so we sort of look at things really over a 12 month to, to maximum three year time horizon um, when we talk about dynamic. And, and so, you know, there are, we do have some views as to, you know, around like emerging markets, particularly um, the fact that they capture the bulk of the supply chain and, and present opportunities going forward. Um, arguably, that's the same in global sort of small caps to a certain extent that, that we're, we're slightly positive on. Um, the volatility, I think, that you saw in the, the particularly the high yield credit space, um, whilst that opportunity still exists, I think it's fair to say it's certainly come back in. Um, you know, and if, if you weren't able to take that opportunity when it was around, um, you do need to look at, you know, the underlying default rates and things that are coming through and, and as to what that opportunity still looks like. But, you know, we don't, uh, when we work with our clients, um, and particularly when you're in volatile times like this, we do, um, we will let the strategic asset allocation, I guess, stray a little bit further than what we would normally. Um, and that's purely because we don't want to be keep bringing rebalancing portfolios back in when markets are so volatile. So we typically give them a little bit more leeway. Um, and that's standard as to what we always do when, when you go through volatility. But not all of our clients take a, a dynamic asset allocation overlay. Um, so, you know, we, we work with both just a strategic as well as also the, the, the DAA side of it. So. I don't know if that sort of helps, but or answers your question. But I think it does. Uh, Michael, we're running light on time, so um, a succinct kind of response, if you could. Yeah, uh, yeah. so we, we uh, certainly have a, a, a more cautious positioning um, against whatever benchmark. So the benchmark is a function of the client requirements, um, and, and we build portfolios to, to meet those requirements. There's no standard benchmark, per se. Uh, but we have clear biases and at the present time and for a while now we have been concerned about uh, excessive overvaluation across many traditional asset classes uh, so we're underweight growth assets 
um, how to build a defensive portfolio at this point to, to, to protect your downside risk is a, is a bit of an issue uh, given the level of interest rates. So looking at alternatives and how they can have a role, uh, how you can affect duration within the fixed income portfolio. All of those things are, you know, as, as Rebecca said, in the realm of more of a dynamic asset allocation process. And we very much uh, subscribe to that. I actually wrote a paper which uh, I think was out in the trade press uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, on this very topic where we feel that the the level of volatility in markets has, has sort of t had a temporary respite and there is this disconnect between what financial markets are saying and what the real economy is saying and at some point that's going to reassert itself uh, potentially so you know but just be a little cautious about that i think imap can uh, has copies of that uh, article if people are interested um, so that's uh, our current views um, and uh, you know we're happy to uh, to stick with that we take a, a very medium term perspective in terms of uh, asset allocation it's there to really enhance returns but a lot of time it's also there about trying to manage risk and uh, we're in an environment where i think risk management is a, a pretty important uh, issue to consider within portfolio construction terrific thank you so from from that it seems that uh, a consultant institution uh, and as michael suggested or otherwise depending on your practice can help you with your governance your uh, processes, the rigor around your investment, whole investment solution, whether it's a, a managed account or just a model portfolio, whether it's running uh, other areas or other considerations such as APLs and so forth. Um, investment consultants can bring value to this area where that is in their day-to-day -day responsibilities and their day-to-day -day work is analyzing, talking to managers, thinking about portfolio construction, thinking about how to blend different strategies and so forth. And perhaps that is a way for businesses, irrespective of the uh, managed account, perhaps that is a way of businesses uh, alleviating something that's perhaps not primary in their expertise, or perhaps it's something that they'd like to enhance as a value proposition to their clients. So uh, the um, consultant can certainly uh, bring some value to businesses. So. Uh, uh, I'd like to wrap it up there and thank uh, our panellists today. Uh, look, Paul, Michael, Rebecca, thank you very much for um, what I think has been a very interesting um, and informative um, discussion. Uh, to Michael's point about his paper, um, yes, that's available on the IMAP website. And in fact, uh, we'll send a link um, to that out to, the, um, out to the people who were registered for, for today's session. Um, you'll also be receiving um, over the next, uh, or, well, within the next hour, um, uh, Survey Monkey for feedback on this and for your suggestions for um, other topics. Um, let me just uh, share with you again um, our um, the the Investec um, topics, which we would um, welcome you uh, participating in. Um, I'm very excited about that. Um, one of the things which um, came up in today's um, session was a little discussion about ESG and the, and the approach that consultants take to ESG. Um, we held a, a webinar a couple of weeks ago now with a couple of, um, a couple of uh, our sponsors um, on ESG issues and incorporating those into managed accounts, uh, Pengana and uh, Pendle. Um, the feedback from that, uh, session was very positive um, and it highlighted the fact that it's clearly um, a topic of considerable interest. Um, we think that we'll be in a position to, to run a series on ESG um, in a, um, we'll be in a position to run a series um, on different aspects of ESG with specific reference to managed accounts. If there was ever a topic which lends itself, or, or an area of investment expertise, which lends itself to, um, uh, to incorporation into managed accounts and to advisors being able to say, um, the reason I'm recommending this particular approach, this managed account to you, is because it's the way I can deliver on your goal of having a responsible or sustainable or ethical or um, otherwise ESG portfolio. So we'll be looking to run um, over a period of a week or so, two or three sessions 
which drill down into the use of ESG in particular. And I'm really looking forward to that um, as an event later, later this year. So thanks very much for your participation. CPD certificates um, will be uh, mailed out or emailed out over the next couple of days. And um, we look forward to you um, joining us again. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.